Let's Let's hunt for the building blocks of nature. Let me start the story from the beginning. I claim that uh, the building of human civilization is based almost completely on the natural curiosity of humankind. And in my view, you can break down this natural curiosity into two separate, well, perhaps not two separate um, reasons. One of them is the natural curiosity that leads to a practical application. You know, the invention of the wheel, the tools used by the ancient civilizations um, for agriculture, the building of the temples and the houses and so on. Curiosity that has a purpose. On the other hand, there is the curiosity that didn't seem at first to have a purpose. The natural curiosity of looking around us and exploring the universe just by staring at it and performing experiments and trying to understand what's really happening everywhere, essentially, everywhere. And as time went on, fast forward a few centuries, people started to realize that one of these curiosities can in fact lead to the other. So the study of the stars, just because we want to study the stars can lead to better navigational systems. The study of the human body, just because we're curious about it, can lead to medicine and curing diseases and so on. And that's essentially where it is today, that our curiosity has this multiple sides to it. Um, today, where we're standing, our ultimate curiosity uh, has led us to a very ambitious program. We want to write down a theory of everything. And when you hear that statement, you think to yourself, oh, hmm, okay, maybe that will explain to me why do I fall in love, or why do I am here, or where am I going? No, no, sorry. Sorry to pop that bubble, but our theory of everything in the sciences is a lot more materialistic than that. It is a theory that, well, it might not give you the answer to the questions of life and everything, but might give you a hint about the universe. It's a theory, or should be a theory, that studies things like the components of matter. What is matter made of? What are the seeds made of? What are you made of? What is the universe made of? On its most fundamental scales. In addition to this, we also study the forces of nature that are related to this matter. And when I say forces of nature, I'm sorry, I don't necessarily mean the wind and the earthquakes or or your mother-in-law. No, I mean something more fundamental than this. I mean the forces of nature that drive everything on the smallest possible scale. And you already know at least two of them. You've heard of gravity, I hope, while it's holding you to your seat. You've heard of electromagnetism, which is, well, I don't know, applications are all around us. You may not have heard of the other two, though. Uh, because both of them work only inside the nuclei of atoms. They are called, perhaps non-imaginatively, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. One is stronger than the other, obviously. Duh. But um, you don't use them on everyday uh, scale, like uh, electricity and magnetism or gravity, for example. But essentially, what we know about the forces of nature is that there are only those four in addition to matter itself. Our theory of everything, our curiosity, wants to understand how these things work. In addition to this, at the very core of this idea of a theory of everything, there is this concept of unification. Not only we want to understand how they work, we only assume and hope that they are related to each other. This is not unusual. We've done it before. In the early 19th century, people studied electrical forces separately from the people who studied magnetic forces. And then in the mid 19th century, somebody came along and said, oh, wait, wait, wait. They are, in fact, the same. They are two sides of the same coin. Now we hear things like the electromagnetic force. We realize today that you cannot have electrical forces without magnetic forces. This is called unification. And we want to understand this. We also assume that eventually this model that we're trying to understand or trying to hunt down for may or may not have some applications. Okay, I, I tell you a story. This guy over here, Sir Michael Faraday, one of the most brilliant physicists in history, um, he developed a lot of electromagnetic theory. Um, long story, he invented this little contraption that he showed it in museums and symposiums. And the story goes, that the Prime Minister of England approached Sir Michael Faraday and said, okay, this is all nice and fine. I see this thing tumbling around, sparks flying all around. 
of what use is it? And the story is that Michael Faraday responded, well, of what use is a newborn baby? You don't know until you wait. He also mentioned, Mr. Prime Minister, I don't know what it's going to be used for, but I have a feeling that you will be taxing it in the future. He was right because his little contraption that he didn't know what was it for is the basic idea for hydropower turbines in the high dam, for example. So you may not know what application your theory is going to have, but eventually it almost always has had an application. So let's go back to this. Matter, what is matter made of? High school physics, electrons, inside, oh, deeper than atoms, electrons, neutrons, protons, these in turn are made of quarks. And there are others you may not have heard of, the muon, the taon, the, and so on and so forth. There are several types of neutrinos. These constitute the atoms, molecules, crystals, and then you, me, and everything in the universe. Surprise. The forces of nature that I mentioned earlier, turns out we discovered that they are also made of particles. It turns out that electromagnetic forces are not just forces in empty space. They are made up of constituent particles. You may have heard of the photon. The strong and weak nuclear forces, the gravity even, are all made of particles, the mediators of these forces. So essentially what we have is a catalog of particles. We've got matter particles, we've got force particles. All put together, these are called the standard model of theoretical physics. Essentially, they should explain everything. I mean, everything is made up of particles and forces. We have a mathematical theory, and believe it or not, that is one single equation in that mathematical theory. Have fun with that. Um, we assume we understand it, but we don't understand yet how they're related to each other. We don't have the unification that we're trying to find. We don't know why there must be an electron. We don't know why there must be a photon. We just know that they're there and we can describe them. Experimentally, yes, we do that all the time. Physicists, scientists, they explore the constituents of matter using large, extremely expensive machines called particle accelerators, sometimes referred to as particle colliders. This thing, which is in Geneva, Switzerland, um, cost what, 20 billion euros to build, and it's got a, an electric bill every year, as much as a city, for example. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, does it have practical applications? Yes, a lot of the engineering techniques that were developed there um, are being used in other applications. A very famous example is the WWW protocol that you and I use daily that was developed as a side product of one of these machines. How do these machines work? Imagine the following situation. I bring you a car, let's say a Cadillac or a Mercedes, and I ask you to tell me what it's made of. And your way of finding out what it's made of is to smash it into the wall and study what comes out. And the faster you smash it, the more comes out, the more detail you can see. Seems like a waste, but that's exactly what they do in these particle accelerators. They smash atoms together, and the faster they smash them together, the more debris comes out, the more detailed we have an understanding. Unfortunately, that's the only way to deal with these things that we don't even see with the naked eye. Well, all of this is fine. Now we understand our search. Now we understand what we're looking for. We want to understand why we have all of these particles. We want to understand if they are related to each other. Unification, that's the purpose of the theory of everything. Do we have it? Do we have a theory of everything? Not quite, but we have candidates. One such candidate, the one that I happen to be working in, is called the theory of superstrings. It's based on a very simple yet very strange premise. It assumes that all these particles, the photons, the electrons, the quarks, and so on, are not quite point particles. They are made of little filaments, little strings that are traveling empty space and oscillating back and forth and colliding with each other. Well, you might be thinking, what are these strings are made of? But you see, that's the trick. They're not made of anything. They are fundamental in the sense that you cannot break them any further than they already are. This weird idea 
has led to strange conclusions. Mind you, we're talking about one single type of string. One type of string. But how can one string be a different particle? Here's the thing. They oscillate differently. Just like a violin string. Imagine this. You pluck a violin string one way, you hear a certain sound. You pluck it a different way, you hear a different sound. That's exactly what string theory proposes. There's only one fundamental string. You plug it a different way, it, you see an electron. You plug it another way, you see a photon. But they're all the same string. Total unification, total understanding of what these things are made of and how they're related to each other. Do we know this to be true? No, it's still a theory in the sense that it's still hypothetical, but it is, answers so many questions. And also, mind this, it also got some nice consequences. I like to call it Star Trek consequence. Who's a fan of Star Trek here? Well, there, I, there you go. I see a lot of you, and I am a fan too. Uh, in string theory, we find that a consequence of this simple idea of strings is that we've got higher dimensions, parallel universes, possibilities of time travel, things that science fiction writers used to be the only people talking about. Now, we publish papers in this stuff. I am, the child in me, the Star Trek fan, is very excited, let me tell you. Well, unfortunately, we don't know if all of this is true. Yes, it's a model, it's a candidate, it's an idea, but we don't know. Okay, why not? Build a particle accelerator, smash a few atoms together, and probe the strings. Find out if the strings exist. Well, the thing is, the deeper you need to probe into matter, the bigger the accelerator must be, and the more expensive it is. And somebody calculated that in order to have a particle accelerator that is big enough to understand or to see these strings, it's got to be the size of the entire galaxy. They are that small. They are teeny. In fact, we do not have any direct way of observing these strings. All we have is a lot of mathematics and a lot of interesting answers without any way for nature to tell us if we are on the right track. Is, is it useless? Do we, are we like completely powerless against it? No, not quite. There are, there are subways or branches of experimentation, like observation, for example. Um, instead of smashing things in the lab, Let's watch a natural occurrence, a natural disaster, something that explodes, the collision of two black holes, something that is large enough to give us clues about this. Haven't found it yet, but we're still looking. Even recently, something called gravitational waves was discovered that opened up a whole new field in astronomy. It's called gravitational wave astronomy. Look it up, it's, it's a fun thing, a uh, fun story. And um, there are also other kinds of particles that string theory seems to predict. If you find those in the lab, strong support for the theory, but at, the, at, at this point, we really don't know. Here's an interesting thing. This theory, our only candidate for a theory of the building blocks of nature, has been under study for 50 years. 1969 was the first paper published. We're still studying it without any experimental backup. So why do we do it? Why do I do it? Why, why did I put my career on something that may collapse tomorrow? There's no experimental evidence. Well, the answer I'll give you is the same answer all string theorists will give you. They'll tell you, I'm sorry, we've stumbled on this rich structure and it just doesn't seem to make much sense that nature has not chosen to use it. Um, that's actually not my words. That's the words of one of the uh, more famous string theorists, Edward Witten. But he's right, there is a very deep structure here. There is an incredible beauty to these equations and it answers so many questions. In addition to this, different models, different ideas come out as byproducts. I think of it personally as um, a laboratory, a lab of theories, the theory of all theories, the theory that if we study it, we understand what a real theory should look like. Um, I kind of try to think that maybe in the future we'll have departments of mathematics, departments of physics, and then departments of string theory where those string theorists are doing neither. They're not doing physics and they're not doing mathematics, they're doing something else entirely. It is that rich and it's that deep. And I don't think it will ever be thrown out even if we discover that it doesn't work. 
uh, in the meantime, the mathematical techniques that we develop um, lead to technologies. Yes, that still works. And there are the side effects of our curiosity that we develop our understanding of, these ma of this math, which leads to engineering, which leads to things that you and I may be using tomorrow or in the near future. Thank you very much.